Secrets of the Dead was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. I make sure I get it and uh, that everybody I know uh, is urged to get it. It's important. Well, I get it every year, you know. No, no flu shots. I don't believe in that. The flu shot, I don't get it. I got it one year and this year I don't get it. Why not? Eh, lazy. Later this hour, Most years we see the flu as a mild inconvenience, a winter rite of passage. But now we check in with that least favorite of holiday traditions, flu season. It can start with a sniffle, so baby. Health officials recommend washing your hands frequently and keeping your hands away from your nose, eyes, and mouth. We tend not to consider it a real threat. Until, seemingly overnight, it becomes one. The flu season is off to an early and deadly start. Yeah, but according to the Centers for Disease Control, already more than 20 children nationwide have died of influenza. The dominant strain of this year's virus is not specifically covered by this year's vaccine. Well, later this hour, we'll check out... Influenza kills nearly 40,000 Americans each year and ranks among the world's deadliest viruses. It is also one of the least understood. A little virus so fragile, you can destroy it with washing up fluid. 30,000 of them sit on a pin's head, and yet it's got eight genes, and yet it can get up your nose, get into your throat, go down your lung, get you into bed, and kill you. Structurally, it's a simple organism, a strand of eight genes, but it can mutate endlessly to circumvent our immune system's attempts to stop it. Every 30 years or so, a mutation results in the creation of a supervirus, a pandemic strain that renders vaccines powerless and challenges our bodies beyond their ability to protect us. Three such strains have cropped up in the past 50 years. But no strain has ever been as lethal as the pandemic of 1918. That year, influenza swept around the world in three deadly waves. <laughs> it began like ordinary flu, with aches and pains, but it ended horribly its victims drowning in their own body fluids, their faces marked by a strange blue cast. It was the worst pandemic in the world's history, even more lethal than the Black Death. Through four years of battle, World War I had killed eight and a half million soldiers. In a matter of months, the flu claimed many millions more. It could be 40 million, it could be 50 million, it could be 60 million. People think of viruses, they think, ah, oh, HIV, that's an important virus. You know, that's spreading around the world, that's killed 20 million people. But I can tell you that if we had another influenza pandemic, and we will have another influenza pandemic, it will make the HIV outbreak almost look like a picnic. The next flu pandemic is overdue. And around the world, scientists are locked in a race against time to answer two questions. Where did the 1918 virus come from? And why was it so deadly? At an armed forces lab in Washington, D.C., virologists are working to crack the genetic code of the 1918 virus before a similar virus strikes today. If we can actually shed light on why the 1918 virus was so lethal and we can understand the genetic basis of that, that information can be applied to the emergence of new influenza strains. And so I think it's just really crucial that, that we do that. But what will we learn? If a virus similar to the 1918 flu emerged, could we stop it? I think the worry is that because of mass transit now, the ability of uh, jumbo jets to carry large numbers of people from continent to continent on, on a daily basis, that you would find that would such uh, a virus emerge today, it might spread much more rapidly than it has in the past. 
And so it's a rather scary thought that we might be uh, worse off in the ability to control the spread of a pandemic today than we were in 1918. The origin of every other 20th century flu pandemic has been accounted for. But 80 years later, no one yet knows how or where the 1918 strain got its start. And as we look forward, what we see is another huge outbreak of influenza, which could be bigger than 1918, could have a greater killing power than 1918. And I would be very surprised if we were not within the next five to 10 years. More than 80 years ago, when the pandemic first hit, there was no warning. Europe had endured four years of fighting. Fresh blood was on its way to the front. German troops were marching in from the east. And from the west came the Americans. The United States had finally joined the Great War. People were very happy. They just felt Americans were going to go and win the war and come back home and live happily ever after. <laughs> of course, it didn't happen that way. Though no one knows for sure, it's long been assumed that this flu began in America. On March 11, 1918, at Camp Funston in Kansas, 100 soldiers mysteriously fell ill during training. They complained of headaches and sore throats, symptoms often attributed to the common cold. A week later, the camp hospital reported 522 cases. An American origin is entirely credible. A large number of the recruits that were in military camps, including Camp Funston, were, were very raw individuals, people that came from a rural background that had not been exposed to urban diseases and had not acquired the level of immunity as their urban counterparts. Suddenly, the young men began to die. That spring, 48 soldiers would succumb to what camp doctors termed pneumonia, but which was, in fact, the first wave of the worst influenza outbreak the world had ever seen. Eighty thousand Americans crossed the Atlantic in March with nearly 120,000 more to follow in April. Was it coincidence that when they arrived in Britain, so did the flu? The large-scale rise in, in influenza incidents in the British Isles occurred when it was clearly on the wane in America. It was a three-day flu. I had it. I remember laying on two kitchen chairs not caring whether I lived or died. Now deemed the three-day fever, the flu spread around the world. But it soon got a more exotic, if somewhat misleading name, the Spanish flu. In Spain, eight million were sick, including the king. In this neutral country, there was no censorship. News traveled fast. This was a wartime situation in which all of the presses of the combatants were heavily censored, the British press included, but the Spanish press was not. And many of the stories that were originating during the first wave were coming from Spain of this catastrophic new disease that was sudden in its onset and that was uh, very, very uh, uh, dangerous. Just where the flu came from was quickly lost in the turmoil of war. A German offensive had smashed through the French lines. As the Allies fought back, influenza moved freely between the Americans, French and British. <laughs> On the British home front, the flu was having a crippling effect. Phone networks broke down. Transit all but came to a stop. Munitions factories were hard hit. 
In Manchester, England, the city's medical officer, James Niven, was overwhelmed by the outbreak. He had rid the city of tuberculosis, cutting its death rate in half. But faced with this new infection, he was suddenly bewildered. The epidemic is increasing rapidly, the worst I have seen in my long experience. There were some who simply blamed the enemy. There were a number of arguments that this was somehow German biological or chemical warfare that had been imported into the British Isles by German spies and that had been unleashed into, into the atmosphere. This was seen as another aspect of German barbarism and yet another weapon in the German arsenal. But the Germans were also suffering. By June, the flu had reached epidemic proportions among their ranks. <laughs> in Britain, the disease seemed to follow the lines of the railways, appearing first in the seaports, going on to peak in London, and then spreading out to neighboring cities and beyond. Those in the country were especially hard hit. July the 19th, 1918. Death of another Flint soldier. Sergeant Barrett, aged 28, of Lake Villas, Gresford, died of pneumonia whilst on leave. In rural Flintshire, England, amateur historian Mary Moore has charted the disease's progress. Among the dead were Mary's own family. My mother's first husband died just after they'd been married. He was very strong physically. He was cultured. I don't think he'd ever had an illness. And yet he was the one that developed the flu. I think there was a feeling of great frustration that men who'd actually survived the war should then die of the flu. It went like a scourge through these rural areas around here. There are cases of small boys that were playing football on Sunday who are dead on Wednesday. They are reports of a brother dying today and a sister dying on Thursday and a child dying on Friday. In Manchester, James Niven was horrified and helpless. At one school, I observed the children falling ill. They simply dropped on the desk like a plant whose roots had been poisoned, the attack being quite sudden and drowsiness a prominent feature. And then, just when they seemed to be at the breaking point, the first influenza wave fell back. It was high summer. Like a reaper, the disease had circled the globe, cut a swath through humanity, and retreated. For the moment, the war effort could resume, and the killing on the front lines could continue. What no one could know was that this was just the beginning, that the war would enable the flu to return in a far deadlier form. There was a kind of symbiotic relationship that developed between the war and the pandemic. It certainly created a epidemic conducive environment. After years of food shortages and anxiety and strain and shortage of, of medical personnel, it was an overcrowding and vast movements of populations and on an unprecedented level, it's clear that the environment was, was very much conducive to the flourishing of a pandemic. <laughs> Within weeks of the first wave of influenza receding, the second one hit. Overnight, it appeared in three continents. In Boston, Massachusetts. In France, at Brest. And in Africa, at Freetown, the capital of Sierra Leone. 
and now the disease had become even more devastating. In September, near Boston at Camp Devens, the death toll reached 100 soldiers per day. The camp's medical staff was overwhelmed. Every morning, the bodies, the corpses were stacked up like cordwood uh, in, the, uh, in the morgue and in the hallway outside of the morgue. That uh, They did thousands of autopsies uh, just in this one camp. It's hard to imagine the conditions under which uh, these pathologists had to work. They had never seen anything like this. Uh, people uh, described that this must be some sort of plague, was a term that was used, that, that hearkening back to the Black Death of the medieval ages, that, that that was the only analogy one could use for something so devastating. So that it was really a, a, an unbelievable situation. Our doctors recognized there was something new. They'd seen influenza before. But here there was something extra. It was like a virus with extra punch. And then they picked out what seems to be a unique feature of that outbreak. This what's called this heliotrope um, cyanosis. This discoloration of the face, the ears. Cyanosis happens when the lungs are so desperate for air that they sap oxygen from blood vessels in the face. Heliotrope cyanosis was coined to describe the precise coloring on the faces of those who died in this second wave of flu. Bluish tones so distinctive that the British Army employed an artist to depict them. And doctors like James Niven noticed another disturbing trend. This flu was targeting the young and the healthy. Frequency of death presents a striking peak at ages 25 to 34. This is totally unlike the behavior of flu in previous pandemics and requires special study. Young adults and children seem to be much more susceptible to be infected with the virus. And then for whatever reason, young adults rather than children were highly susceptible to die. We don't know what influenza viruses circulated before 1918. Uh, we don't know what the immune status of the population by age was to different kinds of influenza viruses, including the, the kind that emerged in 1918 as the Spanish flu. But I think there's pretty good evidence to allow us to, to conclude that there must have been an influenza virus of a similar nature that circulated in the mid-1800s so that people uh, who were middle-aged and elderly probably had at least some protection against the 1918 virus. In four years of war, death had become commonplace among soldiers. Now, it was an everyday occurrence among civilians. I was out with my mum shopping, and I said to her, that lady doesn't seem well there. She said, don't watch her. And I said, but... She's swaying. She sat down on the curb because she was poorly. And then she coughed, so she spurted blood. And she died the next day. Well, I was very upset because she was only a young woman. As things got worse, there were calls for doctors to be released from active service to deal with the crisis. The shortage of medical men is scandalous and disgraceful. It is time more doctors were sent home from the front. They are fighting a foe at home as deadly as the Hun. People are dying off like sheep. In the United States, the situation had turned desperate. Even though 200,000 recruits had been hit by the flu, moves to quarantine the camps were rejected. The war demanded reinforcements, no matter what the cost. Part of the, the tragedy of the pandemic, as far as America was concerned, was that it raised this enormous army. And many of their troops never even saw the front line in, in the First World War, because so many of them died on their way over. You were more apt to die aboard a U.S. transport or in a U.S. base camp than, than you were in the actual firing line. 
By August, a quarter of a million Americans a month were on their way to Europe. But by the time the troops from the Tennessee National Guard arrived in the French port of Brest, there were already casualties. When many of these transports reached Brest, which was the main port of disembarkation, invariably there was a convoy of ambulances there to meet them to take off the dead and the suffering from the pandemic. Those who survived were sent into battle. The Germans would later claim that the flu came with them as an unwitting ally. By then, the Germans had retreated to the Ricaval Tunnel, part of a system of strongholds in northern France known as the Hindenburg Line. They had transformed the tunnel into a vast underground fortress. Losing to the Americans here could lose them the war. The very nature of the site has led Robert Brown to consider whether the flu-addled Americans might have infected the Germans in the midst of battle. Just being here, we get the sense of confinement and enclosure. We don't feel a gust of air or the, the free circulation of air. And once a disease is introduced in that environment, you can imagine it would, it would sweep through here like wildfire. To seize the tunnel, the Americans had to fight their enemy hand to hand. It was a desperate battle, and for the Germans, defeat was doubly catastrophic. The Hindenburg Line collapsed, and the new wave of influenza took Germany in its grip. At least one German medical officer is noted as saying that it was the American army that introduced the epidemic in this tunnel and the German troops that contracted it ultimately brought it back to, to the German homeland. Wherever it came from, within a month, flu was killing 500 people a week in Berlin. The German high command had to accept that the war was lost. When the armistice came on November 11th, the world rejoiced. At 11 o'clock, we heard a great big bang. And I said to my mother, what's that? She said, keep calm. And then we heard the town crier telling us the war was over. Hurrah! You know, oh yeah, the war's over. Hurrah! The relief of knowing that the war was over and finished was absolutely terrific. People went wild in the streets, in apartments, or whatever. But relief was mixed with foreboding. The specter of influenza still hung in the air. For many, the peace brought no release from the pain of losing loved ones. I do remember very clearly being with mother and saying it's over, the war's finished, your daddy won't be going away again. Ada Darwin's father had served throughout the war as a medical orderly. Now he was back home in Manchester. Ada was one of six children and shortly after the armistice, the first to become ill. I remember crying to tell my mother to, to, to stop the others making a noise and making my head ache. And she put me to bed. And I wondered why she put me in her bed and not where I usually slept with my sister. Within hours, Ada's mother and baby brother also came down with the flu. To try to isolate the infection, the family doctor moved Ada from the house. It would be the last time she would see her mother. She looked very sad when I was being dressed to go. And I thought perhaps she was sad because I was leaving her. Childish thought. By the next morning, Ada's mother was dead. I remember being on auntie's knee, crying for my mother. 
And so she said she'd gone to Jesus. I remember saying, well, Jesus had lots of other people. I want my mama. And there was worse to come. Her father had also fallen ill. A medical orderly, he knew the disease's symptoms and what would follow. I remember him going round the bedroom, saying goodbye. I'm sure he must have been broken hearted. The funeral, when it came, was for three people. Ada's father, her mother, and her baby brother. They were buried with military honors. I remember the band and then the body of soldiers marching with Dad's coffin and the Union flag over it, his cap on the top, and the big glass hearse with the black horses. It's like a film in my head. You know, I can always see it. Almost every day I get a letter from someone describing how their grandparents died or their favourite cousin. You know, 80 years later, they're remembering it. So, fantastic impact at the time in a, in a, in a country, in a world that was just reeling from the First World War. And they took it quietly. They really did. Seventh of November, 1918. In the 96 great towns in England and Wales, there were 7,417 deaths compared to 4,482 the previous week. The death toll was mounting, and science had no answers. The reaction to the outbreak from the medical community in general, the clinicians and the pathologists, was just one of uh, total loss. If you put this into context, you can understand why it was so particularly frustrating. By 1918, people felt that great strides had been made in fighting off uh, infectious diseases. And so it was a really huge blow to the morale of the medical community that uh, advances of the last 50 years had all been seemingly worthless, that they were not able to do anything about this. It was not unheard of to find large numbers of, of unburied dead, in, 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 even in the streets that had been un uncollected uh, by sanitation officials. Uh, the public services broke down in many communities because of the number of people uh, that were ill. There was very much a climate of fear. And fear turned to panic. Remember at times my mother wear a mask and you could see her Right, you don't soon forget that. It stays deep within you. When things got very bad, they would run out of the city into the country, but the country here wasn't any better than the city here. They didn't know where the bug was coming from. Recent death, Lieutenant John Gilbert. Doctors are dying, nurses are dying, everyone is ill. Schools are closing, factories are closing, the whole modern society finds itself grinding to a halt. You can't buy coffins, you can't get your parents or your children buried. In 1918, flu was thought to be produced by bacteria, which can easily be seen through a microscope. It was not until 15 years later that the disease was first identified as a virus, thousands of times smaller. And we now know that the virus didn't originate in humans. Influenza originated as a bird virus. It still is a particular virus of birds. Sometimes it kills them. They drop out of the sky like lead balloons. Sometimes it has no effect whatsoever in them, but they're excreting virus in large quantities in their droppings and through their upper airways. Flu strains rarely jump directly from wild birds to people. Typically, they must first infect domestic birds like chickens, then cross the species barrier into mammals such as pigs before they are capable of human infection. 
In the Far East, where known recent flu pandemics have originated, food markets regularly bring humans, birds, and other animals cheek by jowl, ideal circumstances for the virus to exploit. Influenza is fully dependent on its host. It survives and thrives only by invading cells and reproducing itself inside them. Without cells to infect, it would die within hours. What the virus does is it acts like a little terrorist. It gets inside the cell and then it takes over the machinery of the cell. It redirects the cell to change from its normal function to become a little virus factory. And as it reproduces itself in humans, the virus continues to mutate, each time maximizing its chances of defeating the body's immune system. Its genetic structure makes it uniquely well-equipped to do so. The virus has only eight genes, but they are not locked in a fixed structure. They exist as separate fragments, so the virus can change its permutations endlessly. And some scientists argue, even cyclically. This means that a new strain with similar genetic characteristics to the 1918 strain could therefore emerge. And since scientists do not yet know what the 1918 virus looks like, the world would be unprepared for its present-day equivalent. From his lab at the U.S. Armed Forces Pathology Institute, Jeffrey Taubenberger knew that to head off a repeat of 1918, he would have to find the genetic code of the killer virus. For the past 150 years, U.S. Army doctors have stored samples of diseased tissue in the Pathology Institute's archive, especially when a disease tests the limits of their knowledge. Among the 70 million samples are 100 slivers of lung tissue taken during autopsies of U.S. soldiers who died in 1918. Finding them gave Taubenberger hope. I was really surprised to find that there were approximately 100 uh, autopsy cases of U.S. soldiers that died of influenza in uh, 1918 in the files. So I had no idea that there would be so many. Most of the samples came up negative for the virus. It had escaped its victims before they died of secondary infections. But Taubenberger was undaunted. We were just so convinced that this was such an important tact that we just really kept at it, even though uh, we kept getting negative results. Finally, after months of searching, Taubenberger found fragments of the virus in a tissue sample taken from the body of U.S. Army Private Roscoe Vaughn. When we got the first positive case, it was just really a fantastic moment. It's, it's one of these rare things that happen in science to be able to read a very tiny fragment of this virus that killed 50 million people and knowing that we were the first people on Earth ever to have uh, come close to, uh, to, to identifying uh, this virus and, and actually seeing this virus up close. To boost the limited size of his sample, he used a new scientific technique called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. You can theoretically start with just one copy, one piece of genetic material, and make multiple copies, in a sense like making a, multiple copies of a piece of paper on a photocopy machine. And it allows you to go from material that is so limiting that you wouldn't be able to study it at all to having enough material that you can actually manipulate in a laboratory. Taubenberger's team has since examined tissue samples from other parts of the world that contain the 1918 virus. Amazingly, the exact same strain cropped up in each sample, indicating to Taubenberger that the virus had not needed to mutate as it jumped from population to population. What it suggests to me is that this new virus emerged with all the features necessary to allow it to spread efficiently in humans. That is, that uh, large sections of the population didn't have immunity to it, that it was supremely human adapted, that it replicated well and transmitted well from person to person, and that once that virus got into humans, there was nothing that could stop it. There were outbreaks, simultaneous outbreaks, in India, Africa, New Zealand, the United States, Alaska, Norway, England, people were dying left, right and centre. 
Now, how could this happen in a community with no aeroplanes where it took weeks and weeks and months to move around? All that pointed, at least to me, towards the fact that there must have been some precursor waves, some herald waves of outbreak long before 1918 and the virus had seeded itself during that period. Many experts believe the pandemic erupted overnight in the American training camps in March 1918. John Oxford thinks they're wrong. He wondered if there was any evidence of the disease emerging in the more crowded European camps, perhaps even earlier than 1918. He narrowed his search to northern France. The British Army had two million soldiers on that little stretch of the Western Front, which was 70 miles long, 10 miles wide. Fantastic concentration of young people and movement. So I can see why it could very well be a focus there for a virus like influenza in, in, in the British sector. Scanning old records, Oxford came across a 1917 report published in the Lancet Medical Journal. It described a strange respiratory disease which in 1916 had struck the British Army's largest transit camp, a topple. I remember perfectly the day we found it, and the, the student came to me and said, this place is called Etapla. Never heard of it. Etapla, can't even find it on a map. Today, Etapla is a quiet backwater. But during World War I, the railway brought through a torrent of humanity. The camp was the size of a small city, with a dozen hospitals, 20,000 hospital beds, a constantly shifting population of 100,000. A topple was a melting pot. Every infantry division in the British Army had a depot there. So you had the Highland Division, you had the Tyntees Division, you had the Welsh Divisions, you had the Irish Divisions, to which was added four-fifths of the Australian Divisions and the New Zealand Division. They brought labor units from South Africa. They brought in West Indian soldiers. There was uh, almost an unlimited supply of foreign nationals. With its endless troop movements, Etapel in 1916 seemed the perfect breeding ground for a virus. But knowing how influenza finds its way into the human population, Oxford still had questions. This new pandemic virus is gonna come either from an animal or from a bird. So, were there any animals in the camp at Etapla? In particular, were there any pigs? Because we still think that a pig can act as a mixing bowl between the bird, an influenza virus in a bird, and influenza virus in a human. Remarkably, the answer is yes. With 100,000 troops at any one day in that camp, they had to feed them on something. And so the British Army instigated a new experiment, that is, get piggeries into a camp. And we've got photographic evidence of big piggeries in the camp in Etapla itself. Now the next question is, is there any contact of soldiers with live birds? Chickens, geese, ducks? And the answer again is yes. In other words, lots of opportunities for a virus to move from a bird to a soldier. Now you need a third factor. Lots and lots of people. A hundred thousand soldiers in any one day, all of them on the move. So from my point of view, from the point of view of a virologist, it had everything, I think, and more. The Lancet report of a fatal respiratory ailment hitting Etapel in 1916 added weight to Oxford's theory that the camp could in fact be the birthplace of what would become the 1918 flu pandemic. Once you'd seen that article, then a lot of things which were puzzling to do with the mortality rate in the camp suddenly fell into place because I'd noticed in the, in the, in the records of certain hospitals that, that, that they were handling far more sick than wounded during that two and a half month period. The staff reported that six times as many men died of 
disease than died of wounds. And that was something highly unusual in the history of the camp. They thought they'd encountered a new disease. It wasn't exactly pneumonia, it wasn't pure bronchitis. They called it in their article, purulent bronchitis. Men got fevers, men got heightened pulse rates, the lungs were afflicted and Plenty of these men died of asphyxiation and getting this heliotrope cyanosis. But was the purulent bronchitis that swept through Etapel in 1916 caused by the same virus as the 1918 flu? Oxford found tantalizing evidence in The Lancet suggesting the two diseases shared similar symptoms. According to Captain William Rowland, one of the article's authors, the atopal bronchitis was extremely infectious and unusually fatal. Within a month, he said, the disease assumed such proportions as to constitute almost a small epidemic. Rowland listed 20 patients at atopal with symptoms of purulent bronchitis. 13 of them had died. He concealed identities by using initials. But from British Army records, Oxford believes his team can identify at least one and establish what led to his death. The service records are charred from bomb damage, but to Oxford, the story they tell is clear. Private U was Harry Underdown, a soldier in England's Surrey Regiment. He was a farmer's son from Kent. Not a big man, but fit. 5'6", and less than 140 pounds. He said his job on the farm was a hay trusser. Underdown volunteered in December 1915 and gave his age as 20 years and 57 days. Well, not there. Yeah, this that, is him. That's the one. To my way of thinking, he, Harry, would be one of the first cases, maybe the, even the first, to die of what was going to be known within a year or year and a half as the great Spanish influenza outbreak. In the summer of 1916, Harry Underdown was stationed in France. His training had been short but he was needed in the ranks for the Battle of the Somme, one of the bloodiest battles of World War I. In October, he was wounded in action and suffered shell shock. His symptoms included memory loss and the inability to speak. Harry was shipped back to England to rest and recover. Then, after one month, Harry Underdown was sent back to France. And he and his fellow soldiers returned to the mire of trench warfare. This was December 1916, one of the coldest winters on record. In conditions of stress, all resistance to infection drops. Within weeks, Harry was struck down by the mystery disease, purulent bronchitis. He was taken to the base hospital in Etapel. His symptoms included a temperature of 103, blood in his saliva, breathlessness, and heliotrope cyanosis, the same bluish discoloration of the skin that is caused by influenza.
On February 21, 1917, Harry Underdown died, barely six months after joining his regiment. He was 21 years old. The autopsy showed his lungs were choked with blood. Was the respiratory disease that killed Harry Underdown in 1916 the same ailment that would strike down millions two years later? After the 1918 virus had run its course, Captain Rowland's superior, Dr. William Leishman, did make that connection. The dominant symptoms of the two outbreaks were so similar, he wrote, it is difficult not to conclude that one common agent was responsible. John Oxford is more convinced than ever that the origin of the 1918 flu lies in the killing fields of 1916. There were particular circumstances after that Battle of the Somme. So many young people, so much distress, which would lead to transmission of a virus like influenza. The soldiers, all crowded together, would have enabled the virus to move rapidly from person to person to person to person, much more rapidly than in the civilian population. Normally that enhances the virulence of a virus, so the circumstances would have been there, and then it did the final leap from those camps into the civilian population. If Oxford has found the birthplace of the 1918 virus's precursor strain, it would mark a significant discovery. Scientists could begin charting the virus's evolution, and it would confirm that given the right set of conditions, a pandemic flu strain could get its start anywhere in the world. But Jeffrey Taubenberger believes that for Oxford's claim to be substantiated, they must uncover pre-1918 tissue samples of patients like Harry Underdown that test positive for influenza. He and Oxford have been trying to locate bodies buried in permafrost that might still contain such samples. So far, they have had no luck. If these tissues could be found, then, then uh, obviously a uh, rescreening of the pathology itself could be done, but more importantly, the, we could do uh, an examination to see if uh, they still contain uh, influenza uh, genetic material. But in the absence of this material, unfortunately, this all ends up being entirely speculative. Until we get that evidence, we cannot be 100% sure. But on the other hand, I think you, you work with the information to hand. You don't just discard it. You don't discard three detailed papers from pathologists who risk their lives working at Etapler, Oldershot Barracks and whatever. You don't just say, well, forget all that. They don't know what they're talking about. They are telling us over these years the new disease that they described at a it was just the same as the, the disease they saw in the fall of 1918. I don't think we can just discard that and say, oh no, you made a mistake. You got it all wrong. You were there, you did the pathology, you did everything else, but I'm sorry, you made the wrong conclusions. I think more, we should, we should take a, a view that at the moment, the weight of evidence, not proven, but the weight of evidence points towards Northern France and Etapla. I think that uh, all you can say is that there is really no solid evidence that would pinpoint an origin. That there's nothing that we can do to test this hypothesis. It's just not clear. So obtaining the sequence of the virus is the thing that we can do now, and so that's, that's what we're going to go for first. Taubenberger and his team identified six of the eight 1918 flu genes, but they saw the limitations of only having the genetic sequence on paper. They could neither determine how the virus attacks its host nor predict its resistance to vaccines. They decided they needed to see the virus in action. We need to try to develop models to help us understand where those changes are that would lead to virulence. And the only thing we can do is to do that in uh, tissue culture or animal models. 
um, knowing that um, there, there may not be suitable animal models for what is ultimately uh, a human-adapted virus. Um, we, one would hope that uh, we could learn something about virulence by studying animal models that would lead us to an understanding of what happened in people. Uh, that's, that's really the best thing one could do. As controversial as it is to bring the virus that caused the deadliest pandemic in history back to life, Taubenberger's team is doing just that. In an extremely high security lab in Atlanta, Taubenberger's colleague, Terence Tumpy, combined two 1918 flu genes with genes from a modern flu strain. This virus went directly into mouse lungs and it was lethal to mice. And when we looked at the lung tissue, they developed this um, purple discoloration that's often seen with highly pathogenic influenza viruses. They have this tremendous purple discoloration. So it was a very striking finding. However, once the mice received a modern vaccine for the hybrid virus, they formed the necessary antibodies to ensure their survival. Perhaps most importantly, Modern antiviral drugs were successful in treating the mice once the virus took hold. From Tumpy's experiments with mice, can one draw conclusions about human susceptibility to a 1918-like virus? Taubenberger advocates that future tests with 1918 flu genes be done on primates, who have a much greater genetic similarity to humans. But Tumpy feels his initial study is an early indicator that modern medicines would indeed provide protection from such a virus. So I, I think that we may see a new influenza virus that uh, will jump into humans and it might jump into us uh, in a situation where we're just, um, uh, we don't have the immune responses to a new particular virus. But I, I think with the, the surveillance that we have nowadays and the antiviral drugs and the potential vaccines that we'll never have a pandemic as severe as the 1918 Spanish influenza. Despite encouraging evidence that those with access to antiviral drugs might be protected from an emerging pandemic, John Oxford feels we cannot yet write off the possibility of a repeat of 1918. On the one hand, if you're an optimist, you could say there's new anti-flu drugs. There's the capability of making vaccine more now than there was. On the other hand, there's many more people around. There's terrific movement of population around the world. There's 30 million people infected with HIV, or immunosuppressed. So when you begin to put those factors against the other factors, you weigh the thing up, you can come up with a good case scenario and a bad case scenario. The bad case scenario tells you that the situation could be worse than 1918. And I think the best case scenario tells you that there could be 10 or 15 million people dying. Reopen investigations of the past at PBS Online. History is revealing its forgotten secrets at pbs.org. Uncover secrets of the dead. Explore the past. The unknown child deserves to be known. Investigate new evidence. It's a little bit like a detective story. And rewrite history. That legend just doesn't stand up against reality. Reveal hidden truths long forgotten. The most important place in Christianity has actually been ignored. As modern science continues to crack ancient cases wide open. Secrets of the Dead, 